For those who didn't see this year's Red River Showdown, it was absolutely wild. Early in the game, Texas traced out to a 21-point lead and kept the margin at three scores for most of the game before the Sooners put up 25 fourth-quarter points to complete the largest comeback in rivalry history. This game had a lot of yards, a lot of points, and a high-profile quarterback switch, so stay tuned because we're going to talk about all of it in this video about Oklahoma's offense versus Texas. The biggest story coming out of this game was definitely the benching of redshirt sophomore Spencer Rattler in favor of true freshman Caleb Williams. And while Williams did ignite the Sooner passing game to the tune of 212 yards and two touchdowns, a lot of their success also hinged on the big plays generated by their ground game, and specifically by their counter-blocking scheme, which generated the last two touchdowns, including the game winner. So let's start there before getting to the quarterback issue. On a counterplay, two blockers are going to pull across the formation from the backside to the play side. On this play, Oklahoma's running counter to the right, and so the two pullers will be the left tackle and left guard working across the formation from left to right. The first puller across in the scheme will be called the trapper, and on this play, that'll be the left guard. When he pulls, it's his job to kick out the end man on the line of scrimmage, creating the right edge of the hole. The second puller, who's going to be the left tackle in this case, is then called the wrapper, because when he pulls, he's going to wrap around inside the block of the left guard, and it's his job to lead the running back up through the hole. So, these two backside pullers are going to give you your kickout block and your lead block. It's then up to the playside lineman, the center through the right tackle in this case, to block down to the backside in order to create the left edge of the hole. After the snap, the center and right tackle are going to block back on the two defensive tackles to seal them off in the point of attack. Unlike these two blockers, the right guard doesn't have a defensive lineman directly inside of him, and so he's instead going to release up to the second level to cut off this backside linebacker. So to sum that up, a counterplay is defined by its two backside pullers, with the trapper pulling to kick out the playside edge defender, and the wrapper pulling to lead the running back through the hole. The playside linemen then are blocking down to the backside to cut off any pursuit and create the left edge of the hole. In the Texas game, this counter-blocking scheme was one of the stars of the show, popping off for 184 yards with a massive 13.14 yards per carry. This was also the scheme that got them their last two touchdowns, so it was as clutch as it was productive for them. All of the success didn't happen immediately, though. In fact, the Sooners ran 28 plays in six drives before they hit on their first big counterplay early in the second quarter. So now, let's dive deeper to understand the play calling and adjustments that turned this play loose for the final three quarters. To understand why it took counter a little while to get going and why it was so effective once it did, we need to look a little bit at Texas's defensive structure. The Longhorns spent most of the game in nickel personnel, and in this package, they're really a hybrid defense that can throw a couple of different looks at you. We'll start off by treating this common look, which is a de facto 4-2-5. Along the defensive line, they've got two big interior defensive tackles with two edge players outside of them, and those guys each play kind of a hybrid stand-up and outside linebacker role. They then have two inside linebackers stacked behind them, and that gives them a pretty standard six-man nickel front structure. In the secondary, they then play with a fifth defensive back that they call the star, and he's generally going to line up either to the wide side of the field where there's more space or to the passing strength, and this choice depends on where the ball is. Here the ball's in the middle of the field, and so that guy lines up to the side with the most quick receiving threats. In coverage, the Longhorns are a big zone team, so they run a lot of cover two, cover four, and cover three. They want to spend as much time as possible in split safety looks like this one, though, with a deep safety to each side of the field to stay solid against the passing game. When they need to get an extra defender into underneath coverage or the run game, though, then they will frequently spin to a single high look, and they can roll their safeties in either direction, which lets them get that extra defender to whichever side they need him on. Now let's see how all of this worked to shut down one of Oklahoma's early counter calls. Here the Sooners are running counter to the left, and given what we know about this play, we can see that this looks like a good call. Because this is working to the left here, the backside linemen, the right guard and right tackle, are going to be your two pullers. The right guard will be the trapper, so he'll kick out this edge defender, and the right tackle is going to be the wrapper, so he's going to lead through for this linebacker. Meanwhile, the playside blockers, who will be the center through the left tackle, are going to block back on Texas's three down linemen to create the right edge of the hole and cut off pursuit. So far, this looks like a totally plausible blocking scheme versus this front, but there are two potential problem areas. The first comes from this boundary safety up here. As we've seen, all of Oklahoma's offensive linemen are responsible for other defenders, and so if we get one of those safety spins that I just talked about, then the Sooners won't have a blocker for that guy. 
The second potential problem comes from this backside edge defender. Again, Oklahoma's offensive line is all committed elsewhere, and so the concern here is what's stopping that guy from crashing down the line unblocked to tackle the running back before he can turn up field? On this play, Oklahoma's not worried about that safety, and he does stay deep here, so this ends up being fine, but they are worried about that backside edge defender, and so they're trying to account for him with a quarterback read. The idea here is that if that guy sits wide to defend the quarterback, then he can't chase the running back, and so they can just hand it off for the counterplay without worrying about it. On this play, however, that guy doesn't sit wide for the quarterback. He instead crashes down to chase the running back, and so to punish him for that, the quarterback is supposed to pull the ball and work a little RPO, with the tight end releasing out into the flat looking for a pass. The problem here is that this is exactly what Texas wants to happen because they've set a little trap. As we've seen, they're asking that edge player to crash down for the running back, and they're doing this because they are doing one of those safety spins to bring an extra defender down to this side. When the quarterback pulls the ball and looks to work the RPO, that safety is unblocked and will be there to make the tackle. Now, On this play, he doesn't actually have to make the tackle because the star up here completely dominates his receiver and gets there first, but even if that guy would have been blocked, the safety still would have been free, and so early in the game at least, Texas is winning this chess match. As we now know though, Lincoln Riley got the last laugh. Here's a look at their first big counterplay, and we can see that it's run out of essentially the same formation that we just saw. So just like on the last play, we've got two wide receivers here to the offense's right, and then the tight end is lined up to the same side. And we'll remember that last time he was releasing out to this side to run that RPO in the flat. Now there are two or three subtle changes that turn this play from a bust into a success. Remember those two problem spots coming from the boundary safety and the backside edge defender. Well, this time Oklahoma's going to account for both of them. First of all, they're going to bring this wide receiver in motion, and all that he's going to do is release around the far edge to block the boundary safety. Second, instead of releasing the tight end into the flat to run an RPO, on this play, they're going to make him the second puller in the counter scheme, playing the role of the wrapper and tracking down this play side linebacker right here. So why does this change matter? Well, when the tight end plays the role of the wrapper, that means that the right tackle no longer has to pull. And so here, he's going to block out on that backside edge defender, preventing him from crashing down the line after the running back. So this is the same counter blocking scheme that we saw before with all the same advantages. It's just a better way to run it against Texas's defensive structure. Is one final wrinkle. I have to point out the backfield action here because it's actually really cool and really creative. Whereas the first two counterplays that we saw were straight up handoffs from the quarterback to the running back, this play is actually a wildcat snap directly to the running back. Here the running back, before he works that counterplay to the left, is actually going to fake a little toss out to the quarterback, and look at the impact that this has on Texas's linebackers, holding them to the backside or even moving them in the wrong direction just long enough to set up the blocks needed to make this play a success. Now that we understand how this counter variant works, we can recognize it here with 717 left in the fourth quarter and the game tied at 41. So here we get the pre-snap motion from the wide receiver, and now we know that he's releasing across the formation to block the boundary safety. We also see here the direct snap to the running back who executes that little fake toss to the quarterback before running counter to the left. And here again, we see this same counter variant for the game-winning touchdown with 10 seconds left in regulation. A lot more could be said about how Riley sequenced counter with other plays to stop Texas from adjusting to it, and the scheme nerd in me wanted to make that video, but the YouTuber in me knows that everybody probably wants to hear about the quarterback, so with that said, let's switch over to the passing game. Right around the time that Oklahoma started to get their counter game figured out, they also made a switch at quarterback, replacing second-year starter Spencer Rattler with true freshman Caleb Williams. Over the last three quarters, Williams put up a better completion percentage than Rattler and threw for two touchdowns, but perhaps most importantly, he did not turn the ball over, a contrast with Rattler, who both threw an interception and lost a fumble while playing just a little bit more than one quarter. To start getting into the passing game, let's look at Oklahoma's game plan in general and what worked for both quarterbacks. A lot of the Sooners' completions in this game came from their weak side passing attack, so on this play the passing strength is up at the top of the screen where they've got two wide receivers, a tight end, and a running back, and so the weak side will be down here at the bottom of the screen where there's just that one single receiver. Earlier in this video I mentioned that Texas wanted to play split safety coverages as often as possible, and the goal here was to get a safety over the top to each side to help shore things up against the passing game, but on this play that split safety structure is going to cause a problem for them to the weak side. 
to this side. They have a deep half safety playing inside and over the top of that receiver. And if we shift our attention to the cornerback, we'll see that because he has that help player deep into the inside, he's going to play his receiver with outside leverage, meaning that he wants to stay outside of him, taking away the sidelines and forcing everything inside to that safety and the linebackers who are his help players. Now, when that cornerback plays his man with outside leverage like this, one potential weakness is that he does give him a free release for any inside breaking route. And so if that receiver goes inside, he's depending on this linebacker right here to cut him. As the play continues, though, we see that linebacker drifting inside the hash toward the passing strength, and Rattler's able to hit his receiver in that void. This was also the kind of throw that Williams thrived on in this game. So on this play, Oklahoma's establishing a clear passing strength to the bottom of the screen where they've got this three receiver kind of loose bunch set. And then to the weak side, they have just that single receiver up at the top of the screen. As we saw in the last play after the snap, that cornerback is going to drop out a little bit and shift into outside leverage. Again, he's trying to take away the sideline and force that receiver inside to his safety and linebacker help. Again, though, this outside leverage makes him vulnerable to inside breaking cuts. And so as the play continues, we see Williams throws a nice decisive curl to this receiver inside and underneath that defender. Throws like this were the bread and butter of Oklahoma's passing game against Texas and were effective at exploiting a secondary that wanted to play top down and keep everything in front of them. Because the Longhorns were playing this top-down strategy, though, bigger plays in the passing game were often hard to come by, and this is really where Williams was able to separate himself from Rattler, because Oklahoma's best downfield shots in this game came from Williams' ability to create under pressure while keeping his eyes downfield. On this play, for example, Texas is going to cause problems with a cornerback blitz from this guy at the bottom of the screen. That rush is going to beat the running back pretty cleanly in protection, and he's going to be able to get pressure on Williams. But far from being rattled by this, here we see Williams step up and out to the right before throwing the ball 54 yards in the air off of his back foot. Here we'll see something similar with the nose tackle applying pressure this time. After the snap, that guy's going to bully the left guard backwards. This pressure is going to force Williams to step up in the pocket for another long throw on the run, this one traveling 55 yards in the air before being caught for a touchdown. Even when Williams and his receivers didn't connect on plays like this, he did still show a dynamic playmaking ability that always gave his guys a chance to come down with the ball. In contrast, when Rattler left the pocket in this game, whether that was on a called rollout or on an improvised scramble, it ended much more often either in a throwaway or in him just tucking the ball and running it himself for a few yards. Combine that with an ugly interception and a fumble in only six drives, and we can see that while Williams showed an ability to avoid pressure and create big plays off of it, Rattler's offense bogged down and couldn't establish any consistent momentum. Alright, that's it for this video. I'll be breaking down matchups like this throughout the season, so be sure to keep checking back on the channel, and I'll see you here next time.